So thank you. Um, my name is Jeff Richardson. I'm the director for the Silicon Valley OD Network. I'm here with Peter. Um, all right. Uh, I wanted to ask you how to say your uh, your last name because I don't the, want to get it wrong. The easiest and best way to do it is, is just to say Peter D. <laughs> I won't <laughs> trademark that. I, I call myself the Peter D. the second because you know Peter Drucker is obviously the first, but uh, I uh, I go with Peter D. instead of D. Jam Marino. Once you once you've heard it, you remembered it, you'll never forget it. All right. Well, we'll make sure we get that right at the event. That's going to be on June fifth. Oh, wait, fourth, not June fourth, 5th. Fourth, fourth. June fourth. <laughs> I have another event on the fifth. I'm in. And. Uh, Joseph Copeland's here. Um, he's the communication manager for the Silicon Valley OD Network. Thanks, Joseph, for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. So what we're doing is changing up our format a little bit and having interviews with our speakers in advance. So that you get a better insight into really who they are, first and foremost, and then um, you know what, what topics in, you know, what's the focus of that keynote on the forum. Um, so I'm interested, Peter, on how, uh, tell me a little bit about your background, because you obviously don't come as from a, um, a traditional perspective, and uh, tell me a little bit about how you got into the, the CEO suite. Sure. So I call myself a professional CEO, and I even sometimes go so bold as to say I am an OD competent professional CEO. And I, ch I look back and look, carve up my career into four major chunks. In, in the 70s, I was learning. I was learning about computer science, economics, and math, and triple major as an undergraduate at UMass. And then I went on to the MIT Sloan School, where I had a triple concentration, computers, of course, and then strategy, but also organization development. I came across a, um, uh, a survey that had asked graduates who were 20 years out of school what wish they wish they had taken the most more of and OD was off the chart. So I just took all the OD courses I could not even knowing what the heck that was. So I got to study, it turns out, with some of the masters, Ed Schein, Richard Beckhart, John Van Manen, uh, pillars in the, in the community of OD. So I launched into a, a career um, in the 70s, 80s, 90s with a company that was a, a startup within a startup. So the second part was putting all that I had learned to work. What I learned in that first bit was it's all about people. You got systems and strategy and so on, but it's all about people if you actually want to do anything. So in the 70s, 80s, 90s, I put all that to work and, and started out with a 13-person group here in the West Coast that was ultimately 2,000 people worldwide inside of an organization I helped grow to 10,000 people in a billion dollars. Uh, and putting all wow. that to work, uh, it worked. And I said, hey, this stuff really works. But then I realized... Maybe it only worked because of where I was, or maybe I was lucky, and I didn't really know what I thought I knew. So it was, hard, it was really hard to decide to tell the world about it yet. So I decided I needed to prove it. So in the from the late 90s into the early 2000s, I figured I was proving it and honing it and saying, does this stuff that I think I know actually work? And it turns out I had a lot left to learn, and, and it, but it did basically work. But I was able to hone it, tweak it, tune it up, and ultimately – in roles that I had with public, private, venture capital backed and private equity owned ventures generate over a billion dollars in realized value and impact. So, hey, now it really works. And then from 2010 on, uh, thanks principally to American University and the National Training Laboratories, NTL, asking me to consolidate what it is that I was doing that was different, um, that not had not already been written about that they could tell students about mm -hmm. and other executives and i call that the the teaching coaching packaging phase of my career where i'm now putting on paper and on online and in course material um, what i think i've learned that isn't already well known and communicated and putting it in a form that others can use so principally i serve as a board member advisor coach adjunct professor executive educator and that's what i'm currently doing uh, and trying to sort of spread the word. Love it. And uh, that's why for our association, we're constantly trying to find uh, what is that leading edge? What are those things that uh, people might not have got during their degree programs? And, right. uh, 
and how do we do a better job of sharing some of those insights? Well, I've really appreciated working with the association. I, I first worked with you in 2013 when I spoke your key, as a keynote in Atlanta and several times since various sessions and courses and workshops. And uh, you are a great group and I, I've really enjoyed experimenting with you, getting, uh, getting the content out there and working with it. Joseph, what yeah. questions do you do? I, Peter, I have a, yeah, I wanted to ask you, um, right off the top, what are some of the reasons why leaders are unclear um, about, why, about what they want to accomplish? <laughs> well, they're probably, if you ask them, they would think they're clear. And if you ask those around them, they might even think each of them is clear. But then the question is, are they all clear about the same thing in the same way? Mm -hmm. And the only way you can tell is by asking them. And uh, they just never get around to asking. They just assume everybody's thinking of the same thing. And if there is any question, you might see a mandate come down saying, this is the answer. But the reality is you get a better result and more alignment and more commitment if you work on it together. So I think the, the main thing is leaders tend to think they're just supposed to know and then everybody else will just know and it's all a quiet conversation in everybody's head and all we're really doing is unpacking that and putting out on a table in some form or fashion that can be explicitly seen, dealt with, and improved. I wanted to ask you uh, as a way of dovetailing on your answer there, and thank you. Um, do you, and Jeff and I have been speaking about this and um, I'm interested in speaking to more uh, people in the OD community about this, but when you're working with leaders, do you find that you, uh, you're you facing uh, goals that are overly aggressive and how that affects the team? And what's your viewpoint of goal setting and their level of aggression and how I it think, can affect the team? Yeah, I think, I think it works best when goals are what I call aggressive but achievable. Hmm. So it's, it's, you know, in terms of the theory of goal setting, which I've been passionate about since my college days, you know, I remember, remember finally figuring out they always keep moving the goalposts back. No matter what you do, they always, somebody always wants more. <laughs> um, but, but, in, but in terms of uh, having actualized and lived goal setting and seeing how it impacts people, you know, you sort of basically two theories. One is under promise and over deliver. The other is aim high, do better. So in the under promise over deliver, you know, people want to be conservative in their goal setting so they can beat their goals and celebrate when they're, vict when they're as the victors, when, they're, when they exceed them. Um, the problem is that you, you tend to be too conservative and not aim high enough and therefore underperform overall when you use that approach. So the other approach is to aim high, maybe higher than you can ever achieve, but when striving to achieve something so great, you'll certainly come closer than if you hadn't tried. And in fact, there is a gap between uh, how well you end up doing by aiming high and doing better but not quite hitting the goal as compared to overachieving. And I like to play in that space right there. I, I don't like to have goals too high because you demoralize the team when they're not making them. So I say like 75% of the time, you ought to be achieving the, the, the goal that you're managing to. Now, you know, you have different, different kind of goals in different kinds of situations. If I'm talking to my bank or my investor, I want to be laying out what I know I can do. Mm -hmm. When I'm talking about management and managing my team and my company and my people, then I want to be setting goals that are aggressive but achievable. Very good. I think that's a great differentiator there uh, about who you're talking to and the purpose of that goal. Right. And so, the, um, oh, I'm sorry, Jeff, go I was ahead. Ask about, um, if you were going to give, you know, one secret, what, what are one of those key kind of things that you found that uh, may be more important than others when it comes to driving change? Oh, well. You know, change is everywhere all the time. Um, if you have a, a specific place you want an organization to get to, then I found over time that it's best to think of it as three purposeful evolutions that are intertwined. It's an evolution generally in systems, an evolution in process, and a level an, uh, an evolution in people or organization. And what's, what's interesting and what, what's tended to happen, you know, since the 80s, 90s, 2000s, we've seen a crush of systems evolutions and process evolutions. 
and 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 those were fantastic, right? You could spend a lot of money, do a lot of goodness to the organization, make a lot of change. When people say those initiatives failed, what they're not really saying they outright failed. They're saying they failed to live up to their full potential to deliver value to the organization. So they didn't outright fail. They just didn't do everything they should have done. And generally, the reason is they didn't get the people part right. Because they didn't realize that in addition to a systems project, which is very tangible, you know, they get this system, this organization, you got to spend this much money to have these people do that. That's pretty straightforward. Same thing with the process evolution. But when it comes to the people part, there was so much money and expense and focus on the systems and process. You never got around to even realizing it was a project. So it didn't happen. So you have what I call missed lift. Well, guess what? That lift is still there to be had because it wasn't picked up. And now systems evolutions are far easier because the systems are much better, more configurable, generally run by a utility in a SaaS environment as opposed to having to be installed behind the firewall in your organization. So you don't have to spend as much. It's not just all consuming. You have capacity to free it up to focus on some of these other things. Same goes for process. So the people side now is really where the action is. And what we're finding is it's viable. It's, it, it's not a system. It's not a process evolution. It's an organization evolution, an evolution in the way you want people to think, the way you want them to behave, the way you want them to interact, the way you want them to be striving and incenting to, to do accomplish things. So those things now get the focus and we are now seeing like we did in the 70s and 80s, 90s, instead of teams of people helping to put systems in, as in computer systems, we're now talking about people getting trained and geared up and scaling up to provide help evolving people systems or people and organizations and the way they think, the way they work and the culture, as you can see in the press is becoming you know, it's central to everything everybody's thinking about these days is how do we get people to think and behave and perform the way we want? So, you know, in the, the end of it is realizing that it's a triple evolution, systems, people, people, and process, and that for the last 30, 40 years, we hadn't gotten around to the people part, but now is the time. And even if we just did the people part, we get a huge lift. So I claim I can go into any organization and just focus on that within, any, within some short period of time, find ways to get an enormous lift and it's there to be had. It's not that hard. It just has to be focused on and done. That's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, you see the numbers are around engagement and uh, right. certainly some great opportunities. Um, and Joseph, you have one more question? For I, I did. I had a question about, you know, with so much historically um, dealing with the uh, gift of your work towards people and helping people um, on the one hand, there's been a dismissal of it being soft skills in the corporate structure. On the other hand, there's a huge pressure for metrics and measurement. Um, how are you balancing um, some of these biases and, um, you know, able to provide some of the Im important things you do in, in a climate that often dismisses benefits to people with soft skills and then at the same time wants it measured in, in, in the most accurate way? Well, you're, you're, you're right about that. I mean, we don't sell or lead with the process componentry. Mm -hmm. So we don't sell OD. We sell the outcome that mm -hmm. we're striving for and deliver it with OD. So it's like saying, you know, what's the value of math? What's the value of economics? Mm -hmm. OD is just a set of things you know how to do in the same vein, right? So it, that's irrelevant. What we're going for is whatever improvement you're looking for. So what's the outcome that we're looking for? Is it more revenue, uh, less cost, more customers, um, different market? I mean, as you just deliver it by doing OD. So we're not, we're not imagine, evaluating the, you know, engagement or, <clears throat> you know, number of happy smiles or, or whatever. It's whatever business outcome that we're striving for. And we just happen to be using this as a way to get there. Very good. Thank you. Part of that business outcome is the implementation and how things uh, how sticky things are for people to yeah so, up with. so what like there's a great example um it's, it's a little bit dated now but at alcoa a couple dec decade or so ago i, I forget the, the ceo's name who came in but he wanted to change the, um, the way everybody thought about safety and it turned out that just by focusing on that everything got better Right. So what he was really doing is going to make everything better. And that was just the way to do it. And that's an example. Great. Well, um, 
In the event on uh, the fourth, what are some of the key topics that you'll be uh, touching on? Well, the I, I operate, as you know, on the platform called Intelliben. And as I've put my content out there for others to, to work with and to share, the, um, the, the central nugget that I build my content around is called a tool. So we have a toolkit now and a toolbox on my website with over 50 tools. And the, the, each tool has a graphic that brings to mind a certain set of concepts that are explained in, con, in related posts and insights and videos. So each tool sort of opens a gateway to all that content. In my course, which is offered now to uh, mid-career executives that are striving to you know, get on track to performance and growth to fulfill their potential, uh, I, I focus on, we focus on about half a dozen of those 50. In the, in the workshop, uh, that we'll be doing on the fourth, we'll be taking a subset of those. So it will be four of them. And we'll be working through uh, case, case examples and an opportunity to actually experiment with them. Now in the course, your case, whatever it is where you're working on in your life is the, is the, is the course. So you come as a leader in a team working on your business that so we talk about what problem does your, does your organization solve and for whom? Because as you know, the definition of a business is you solve a problem for a customer. So we have a template and a tool, sort of the cornerstone tool, which we call the WWW, who, what, why. Who do you serve? Mm -hmm. Why do they buy you? Uh, and what is it you bring to, the, to, to, to their world that they want to buy for, for what reason? And, and that gets us going. So we'll introduce that tool. And what we'll do is have as many people as would like fill out a template for their own organization prior to the session. Uh, and then in the session, you'll get to work, a few of those will be used as examples and we'll show you how to play, how to improve them, how to, how to get them tighter and work a process to get a team of people aligned around the same WWW, not a good, better, best one, but the same one and show the power of that. And we'll show how uh, it's good to do, it's easy to do, but it takes real work and it's worth doing. So that's the WWW, then we'll, then we'll look at uh, alignment. Uh, how do we get uh, a top team to all be trying to take you, deploy their great strengths to the same end goal for the same purpose and reasons? And there's an exercise that will bring that to life. And then, if you think about going off site and coming up with a, you know, you've collected some data, you've been analyzed and consolidated, you go off site and work with the top team, come up with a list of things you want to do going forward. And that's your strategy workshop your strategy offsite, and then uh, the year goes by, a year later you go and do that all again, and what are the odds you think you'll end up with the same list? In other words, how many of the things you did last year actually got done? Well, the thesis we have is that there's a gap that gets created between the strategy offsite and the activation of the implementation initiatives mm -hmm. to make those things come alive. And we have a systematic way of changing that dynamic so that rather than ending the workshop at the point where the list is generated, you do one or two more exercises that actually launch the initiatives. We call it initiative to action. And we, we make sure you don't lose the rich thinking that led up to these initiatives by using a template we call the change framework. That says not just what you have to do, but where are you now? Why does it need to change? What will things look like when they have changed? What do you need to do to get there, which is the initiative list? Why will that be hard? So you tell the story and then take the story from that offsite and into the flow of the day-to-day -day after the worksite so that you um, actually begin the project, if you will, in the, works, in the workshop. So the, the level of energy doesn't peak and, and go away. It actually is launched at the offsite. So we'll talk about how to do that. Awesome. Yeah, that sounds awesome. like people should uh, sign up early so they can have a chance to download the uh, the template and do some work uh, prior to showing up. Yeah, and you know, if you don't if you don't get around to it, that's fine. We'll work with what does come in, but it will only make it more valuable if you get around to doing it. And all of this is a tease, really, because you know it's just an hour, but there's you know 20 hours of of the course uh, that we'll be offering this summer. We have a special arrangement for anybody who wants to sign up through um, you, uh, the associations that are sponsoring this 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 overview. Uh, we'll have a special arrangement to get it to participate for half price. We've got some great teams that have signed up. It's going to be a great session, and we love talking about it. Yeah, we're looking forward to it as well. Um, as mentioned, uh, we're actually partnering with the Association for Strategic Planning on this event, so it should be uh, uh, a great event for all of us. So. Great.
Great. Thank you very much for contributing your time, spending a little uh, uh, time today to give us the bigger picture, and uh, we'll see you on June 4. Looking Peter, forward thank to you it. very much. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye.